Hello, I'm Kevin Costner. Welcome back to 500 Nations. Most Americans grow up with the story of the pilgrims landing at Plymouth Rock and how they were the first to encounter Indian people in an untouched wilderness. But in fact, the arrival of English colonists was by no means the first encounter. By the time the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, English slavers and traders had been working the region for decades. Two of the first Indian people the pilgrims met spoke English. One of them had even been to England. It would have been easy for the Indian nations to destroy the original settlements, but they didn't. Instead, they welcomed them as potential trading partners and allies. They gave them land and the knowledge of how to survive on it. But nothing in the experience of the Indian nations had prepared them for the European invasion that would follow. But before we look at the first colonist, we'll go north to a people the English would never conquer, the Inuit, the people who most of us know as Eskimos. Welcome to part four of 500 Nations, Invasion of the Coast. And I think over again my small adventures when, with a shore wind, I drifted out in my kayak and thought I was in danger. My fears, those I thought so big for all the vital things I had to get and to reach. And yet, there was only one great thing, the only thing, to live, to see, in hunts and on journeys the great day that dawns and the light that fills the world. Inuit. In the northern reaches of the continent, straddling the Arctic Circle, lies an island larger than Great Britain, Baffinland. This was the world of the East Baffinland Inuit, people commonly known as Eskimo. For the Inuit, the spring thaw was a time of euphoria and plenty. Small bands would move to summer camps along Baffinland's great southern bay. There they would hunt caribou along the coast, and seal and walruses in the rich marine waters. The great sea has sent me adrift. It moves me as the weed in a great river. Earth and the great weather move me, have carried me away, and move my inward parts with joy. Uvavnuk, Inuit. The summer of 1576 would bring something different. That summer, English sea captain Martin Frobisher led an expedition in search of a northern passage to the Orient. In July, he passed between masses of broken pack ice and through a mountainous channel he named Frobisher Straits. As the English sailed into the bay, several Inuit launched their kayaks and paddled toward the ship. Events were followed by the ship's chronicler. Our captain discovered a number of small things fleeting in the sea afar off, which he supposed to be porpoises or seals or some kind of strange fish. But coming nearer, he discovered them to be men in small boats made of leather. The Inuit offered fish, sealskin clothing, and friendship. 
one man agreed to guide the Europeans through the Straits to a place Frobisher believed to be the Pacific Ocean. Five sailors were dispatched in a small skiff to row the Inuit guide to his kayak on shore. Then, for reasons that may never be known, the Englishman disobeyed Frobisher's orders not to row out of sight of the ship. Contrary to his commandment, they rowed further beyond that point of the land out of his sight. He could not hear nor see anything of them, and thereby he judged they were taken and kept by force. Although Inuit continued to approach the ship for trade, Frobisher was convinced of treachery. Preparing to weigh anchor, he decided to take a prize back to his patrons in England. The captain was oppressed with sorrow that he should return again back to his country without bringing any evidence or token of any place whereby to certify to the world where he had been. Frobisher held out a bell toward an Inuit trader whose kayak had drawn near the ship. Reaching toward the hand outstretched in friendship, Frobisher seized the man, dragging him aboard. He then set sail for England, leaving behind his five missing men. But Frobisher would be denied his living trophy. Aboard ship, the captive Inuit defiantly bit his tongue in half and later died. Soon after Frobisher left Baffinland, the winter ice flows closed the bay and the Inuit returned to their winter lives. The following summer, Frobisher returned to Baffinland. On July 31st, one of his ships put ashore at a point some 150 miles from where his five men had disappeared the previous year. Stumbling upon a vacant Inuit summer camp, they found articles of European clothing. In these tents, they beheld a doublet of canvas made after the English fashion, a shirt, a girdle, three shoes for contrary feet and of unequal bigness, which they well conjectured to be the apparel of our five poor countrymen. The next day, Frobisher sent 40 soldiers back to the area, where they surprised 18 Inuit men, women, and children. As the Inuit fled their tents, the English opened fire. Dodging bullets, the Inuit ran for the shore. Launching a large boat called an umiak, they tried to escape to open water, but English boats forced them back against the rocky coast. Frantically, they climbed up the crags above the waves. Soldiers surrounded them from land and sea. While women and children huddled against the rocks, the Inuit men fought for their lives. And desperately returning upon our men, resisted them manfully so long as their arrows lasted. And after gathering up those arrows which our men shot at them, yea, and plucking our arrows out of their bodies, maintained their cause until both weapons and life utterly failed them. And when they found they were mortally wounded, with deadly fury they cast themselves headlong from off the rocks into the sea, lest perhaps their enemies should receive glory. Some Inuits scrambled over the rocks, slippery with blood and the wash of the sea, and escaped. A woman and her wounded child were less fortunate. Frobisher took them captive. 
Along with a man he had captured days before, he had now collected a set of Inuit people. As his ship sailed for England, Frobisher displayed little compassion for the kidnapped victims torn away from their homes and families. They were confined together, the English crew allowed to watch them for entertainment, hoping to see them mate. Having now got a woman captive for the comfort of our man, we brought them both together, and every man, with silence, desired to behold the manner of their meeting and entertainment. The crew was to be disappointed by the couple's dignity. Although they lived continually together, yet did they never use as man and wife, and they both were most shamefast lest any of their private parts be discovered. Upon arrival in England, artist John White painted these portraits. Soon after, the Inuit man, woman, and child all died of illness. The following spring, Frobisher sailed on his final voyage to the Inuit world. This time, no one came forward to greet the ships. The Inuit held themselves aloof, refusing contact. The English never solved the mystery of their missing men. But for centuries, the Inuit would tell the story of the five white men Frobisher abandoned. It was said that, after living peacefully among them, one spring the five men outfitted an umiak with a mast and sails and departed, never to be seen again. <laughs> 